The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. The title of the message this evening is Not All Suffering Should Be Avoided. And I know what you're thinking when I say a title of a message like that, but part of me thinks, oh no, not another message on suffering. Not another message on suffering. It seems like suffering comes up so often in the text. And, and honestly, I feel like as I'm going through First Peter and as I was going through Galatians and I was going through the book of Acts, it's just so often that we're able to speak about suffering. And that's because the truth is there is a great deal of suffering that happens on this earth. And I think there are two reasons that you might not like the idea of another message on suffering, at least for me. The first one is I think sometimes we think of the Christian life as just all doom and gloom. And as we look at the text, and we see suffering come up again, we're like, oh yeah, Peter's just preparing for Christians for suffering because all of the Christian life is suffering. And the truth is, that's not the case. And I hope in the message tonight, that'll be very clear. The Christian life is not doom and gloom. Suffering is a fact of a fallen world. But as Christians, at least we have a a comforter to help us. The second reason is because as we come to another message on suffering, my thought is always, oh no, God must be preparing us for suffering. And I think that is legitimate fear. I think that's a legitimate thing, that that God is preparing his people for suffering. But I don't think it's that he's going to put us through suffering simply because somebody preached on suffering. I think he's preparing us for suffering because suffering is a fact of life. And we will go through it. And so when suffering comes, we ought to be prepared for it. I think there are a lot of churches that don't speak truth about this area And when their people go through suffering, they're very lost. They really don't know what to do with suffering because it's just not expected in the Christian life. And that should not be the case. It's our job as pastors, it's it's the job of leadership of this church um, to prepare our people for suffering. And the wonderful thing is, if you preach the Bible, if you go through it, you will have ample opportunity to do that. And so we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 17 this evening. And this passage deals with the heart of Peter's message in his entire letter. It is the reason behind his letter. He's he's telling people that in this life there will be some trouble, there will be some suffering, but he's also giving them hope that there is eternity, that there is an inheritance waiting for them, that they are secure in the hand of God. And so as we delve into our text today, I think it's important for us to understand some of the differences and some of the similarities between our culture and our lifestyle and that of the Roman empire in the first century that Peter is speaking into that context. There are many troubling things in our culture that are happening around us all the time. I am not the type of person to be, oh no, everything is awful all the time. I'm not the type of person to buy into conspiracy theories and just to look at always the worst part of everything. I don't don't think I'm that, that guy. But even though I am cautiously optimistic about things, I find that the moral decay in our culture and just the, the, the quickness that it's happening. I mean, the fact that I am 30 years old and I can look back at my childhood and think, wow, morality was different in the eyes of many people. That's like 15, 20 years ago. That's not very long. And so how quickly morality in our country is changing is something to be concerned about. The change in our sexual ethics, in our devaluing of life, is happening at an astonishing rate. The direction of our educational system in Ontario has me concerned. I think there are some things about the educational system where they're they're becoming more and more involved in the morality and the principles and the values of their students, and they think that it's their job to instill that in their students rather than that being the job of parents. And that is a a troubling thing. I believe it's the educational system's job to teach education and to teach sciences and to teach knowledge, but not to try and sway the children as to what they should believe and what principles they should follow. Um, the, if you've been watching the election kind of transpire and all, all that's happening in the States, I think that as much as it's entertaining, as much as it's kind of like this, this fun circus to look at, it is a kind of a scary thought that that's what the state of the highest level of politics in our sister country is. And so I just think that we look around and we see that 
trouble. And, and if, if not just those things, there's so much more. We look at the world and we see an increase of persecution happening among Christians all over the world. I've heard that Christian persecution is worse now than it's ever been. And to think that in the 21st century, there are people who are dying daily. I think the average is at least six Christians die a day for their faith. That is, it's awful. So we have much to be concerned about. And I am thankful for the country we live in. But that, that's when we survey our culture around us. But I hope it's, it's helpful for us to realize that during Peter's day, the Roman government, the Roman Empire, was not better than the, the country and the culture and the world that we live in today. Roman society was a very immoral society. And much of their pagan worship was sexual in nature. They had slavery of the very worst kind there. Fatal violence was sport. Now, at least here in our culture, we put on gloves and we have a referee, but there it was just all-out gladiators killing people. That was fun for them. The emperor was expected to be worshipped. So when we think back on their culture, I hope we realize that we're not talking about a day where everything was sunshine and roses and the Christians just got to live out their days in, in just this bliss. It's not like that at all. They had much to be concerned about with their culture. They had many obstacles to overcome. Francis Schaeffer, back in the 1970s, wrote, and he was comparing Roman society and the society we live in in North America. He said, in our era, sociologically, man destroyed the base which gave him the possibility of freedoms without chaos. Humanists have determined to beat to death the knowledge of God and the knowledge that God has not been silent, but has spoken through the Bible and through Christ. And they have been determined to do this even though the death of values has come with the death of that knowledge. You see what he's saying here? He's, he's saying that, that the base of where we get our values from has been attacked. And so now we live in a society where to believe in God and to believe that people should get their values from God is all of a sudden a ludicrous thought. That it's, it's kind of passe. It's, it's the old way of doing things, but we know better now. But as we've done that, as we've taken God out of our society and out of our culture, what we've done is we're, we've removed the foundation that we can build real values on. And so now we have no sure foundation for ethics and no sure foundation for morality and morality and ethics become whatever you want them to be. So he goes on and he says, Pompeii, speaking of Rome, has returned. The marks of ancient Rome scar us. Degeneracy, decadence, depravity, a love of violence for violence's sake. The situation today is plain. If we look, we see it. If we see it, we are concerned. And that's the truth. When we look around us today, as Peter did in his day, we see degeneracy, decadence, and depravity. And so the difference between first century Rome was not the sinfulness of man, and it wasn't even the sins that man was participating in. The difference between them and us now is at least for Christians here in our country, we have a government that protects us from persecution that inevitably will come when light lives in the same neighborhood as darkness. It's becoming more and more apparent that as the culture gets darker, the light should be more obvious. And as that happens, light and darkness, they just don't mix. And so right now, we should be thankful. We still have a government that does protect us. But that is, that is not going to be the case forever. And that was not the case for Peter in Rome. And so in our text... We will be encouraged to stand with God no matter what we encounter. No matter what situation we go through. We will be encouraged to suffer when necessary for the gospel's sake. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll begin our reading in verse number 13. Peter says, And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? Who will harm you if you follow that which is good? I've just described to you what Roman culture was like. And so I feel like for Peter, the answer to this question should be obvious. It almost seems like an insane question. Well, let's see, Peter. The Jews hate us. 
Because they think that we've altered and changed their traditions. They think that they're, they're, they're saying that Christians are saying we've killed the Messiah, God's Holy One. And so they have a great deal of reason to persecute the church. And they have been. The Jews have. And then you have the Gentiles. So all those just pagans that, that live around them who say, well, you're not worshiping our gods. And because of what you're doing, the worship of our gods is in decline. Think of a place like Ephesus, when all of a sudden the idol makers can't make any money, which is a wonderful thing. Praise the Lord for that type of thing happening. But this is what's happening. And so all of a sudden, the city, the Gentiles, want to revolt against the Christians, persecute them, kill them, put them in jail. Why? So that their economy will go back up. And then you have the government of Rome, the Roman Empire. and They're demanding worship and not receiving that worship from the Christians. And they need a group of people that the whole world can gang up on. And so that conveniently became the church. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul wrote that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. They were living in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. They were living in the midst of a nation that would persecute them from every side. And and so it almost seems crazy for Peter to say, who is it that will harm you? Everybody would harm them. There was lots of people to harm them. So that verse only makes sense if you read verse 12 before it. Verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And in the light of that truth, the fact that God is watching, that his eyes are over the righteous, that he's listening to their prayers, and that he's against those who do evil, who is there that can really harm us? In light of that truth, verse 13 makes a little bit more sense. And that's why in Acts chapter 5, verse 29... Peter could very boldly say with the rest of of the apostles, we ought to obey God rather than men. In the face of persecution, he can say, I have a God who is watching me, who is listening to my prayers, and who is against them that do evil. And so who do you think I should obey, God or men? Because in light of the fact that there's an almighty God out there, who else can really harm us? I mean, maybe temporarily, at best. Verse number 14. But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And that term is not, you're super excited and happy and you should be laughing all the time. The term is that you're blessed. If you suffer for righteousness, yeah, you might not be happy. It's going to be difficult, but you're blessed, truly. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Verse 13, he says, you have nothing to be afraid of. Then verse 14 here, he says, even if you suffer for righteousness' sake. See, Peter is not blind to the fact that suffering is going to happen. And so he says, if you do suffer, and you might suffer, Make sure you're suffering, pursuing, or doing that which is right and just. Do the right thing, even if it costs you. Even if you're beaten and hauled off to prison. Even if it means you lose your job, or you lose your business, or nobody will buy from you at the market anymore. Even if your neighbors and your family turn against you. Even if it means that the the liar, or the one who only works when the boss is around is the one that ends up getting the promotion. Even if speaking truth means that you lose something. Even if speaking truth means that your friends and your coworkers are less impressed by who you are. It says, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Even if the worst happens, you're blessed. And what Peter's doing here when he begins and he says, be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready for an answer. Peter is quoting from Isaiah and he's quoting from Jeremiah. 
And so he's quoting from prophets who are, who are writing during a time when there was certainly persecution happening. And he says, don't be afraid of their terror. And it literally means, do not fear their fear. There, it's kind of a strange phrase there. Do not fear their fear. What do you think that means? I thought of two things that it might mean. One of them is, do not fear their fear. In other words, don't be afraid of what they're trying to do to make you afraid. But it could also mean, don't be afraid of their response to who you are, to you. See, it's, it's, it's partly, I believe, the fear of the darkness that causes them to respond the way they do towards the light. And so don't fear their fear. In, in, in other words, don't be intimidated by how they're reacting to you, that they're reacting to you in a way that is actually their demonstration of their fear. Don't fear their fear. Don't be intimidated. It says, don't be afraid, don't be troubled. In other words, don't allow how they act to determine how you act. And this is, this is you could draw a line through this in the book of First Peter, where he's constantly encouraging us not to be changed, not to be controlled by our circumstances and by people around us. That our actions and our attitude and our beliefs and, and our joy should not come from other people around us and by how they're treating us. That it should come from within and from the Lord. Instead, he says, we need to do two actions and we should demonstrate two attributes. He says, instead, we should sanctify the Lord in your hearts. The word sanctify means to make holy or to consecrate, to set apart. So he's saying, set God apart in your heart. Now, we might immediately think, oh, yes, I get what that means. I know that that means that I just need to have really good, warm feelings toward God. Okay? And maybe that's a part of it, but that's just a part of it. Your heart in the Bible is not your feelings. Your heart in the Bible is your decision-making center. And so, if the Bible was speaking about our, our bowels, it would be speaking about our feelings. If it's speaking about our minds, it's our intellect. But when it's speaking about your heart, it's speaking about somewhere, some combination of those two things that actually is your decision-making center in your life. So you are, you make decisions based on your mind, based on how you think, and you make decisions based on how you feel. And as those two things come together, that is your heart. And so he says, in that heart, in that decision-making center of who you are, consecrate God or set God apart. Give God a special position of authority. That's what he's saying. Saying, don't just be swayed by the first thing that comes along, by the first thing that sways your feelings or your intellect. Have a special place for God in that decision-making center. So consecrate God, set God aside in your hearts. And then he says the second action, so we set him aside, and then we prepare ourselves. We prepare ourselves intellectually. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It says, be ready. Don't be a fool. Don't be a person who is just a blind follower. When people get saved, I, I get this, most people don't get saved through intellectual arguments. You don't go up to a person and be like, and they say, well, I don't believe in God because I believe in science. And you can say, okay, well, here's some, some scientific facts, and here's the difference between how a creationist and how an evolutionist would see these things. And all of a sudden they go, oh, yeah, I, I see that. Okay, I'm going to be saved. That's, that's not how the whole thing goes, right? People become saved because they're convicted of their sin, because they see themselves as a sinner, because they see themselves as lost, and they reach out to the only salvation available. However, I don't think God wants his children to then turn our brains off for the rest of our lives and never try and learn things about truth and about science and about reason and about any, any of these other areas that the world points the finger at Christians and say, well, you're wrong because. No, the Bible actually tells us we should be ready to give an answer. For some of us, we love this kind of stuff. For some of us, it's like, yeah, I, I want to be ready. I want to get into apologetics. I want to get into studying. And for others, it's like, I don't need to know any of those things. And what I would say to you is that every person is called to do and to be and to learn some things that is different than, than they naturally want to be. And so last week, we looked at my life and how showing mercy is a difficult thing for me to do. 
It's something I have to learn to do. It's something I have to force myself to do. It's something that, that is right to do, but it doesn't come natural to me. And so as a believer in Christ, I need to get out there and show more mercy. Well, some of you, you, sh- you need to force yourself to say, you know what? I'm going to try and learn some of this stuff. I'm going to try and come to the Sunday school class. I'm going to try and um, take an opportunity to listen to a, a sermon or a teaching or, or to read a book that is going to help me to defend my faith better. Because the Bible tells us we should be ready to give an answer. And so there are two things that we're expected to do. Set God aside a special place in our hearts, in our decision-making centers, and then prepare ourselves intellectually. But he, he goes on, he doesn't stop there. Because there are a lot of people that are like, yeah, I'm going to prepare myself intellectually so that when I get into argument, I will crush them. Okay? There's, there's a lot of people like that. Um, but that isn't how we're supposed to go about it. All right? He goes on and he says, with meekness and fear. There are two attitudes that ought to characterize how we act toward the world as we're setting God aside in our hearts and preparing ourselves and defending the faith. With meekness and fear, it's humility. And we've already been told not to fear people, so it's not fear of people, but we go in there with, with humility, and we go in there with the fear of God, recognizing that, that this is almighty God that we're serving. Sometimes we, we make these arguments that we have with people so personal that we, we are becoming proud and we're becoming arrogant. And the idea is, we are just a, a servant of God, and so stay humble. Truth is God's. Truth is not yours. You don't own it, so don't make it personal. When you have a conversation where we're fearing God in the midst of that conversation, we will do a much better job dealing with people the way we ought to, representing God well. It, it won't become this matter of pride and arrogance. We engage the world around us with humility, with meekness, and with the fear of God. Peter goes on to explain the result of our right attitude and our right behavior. Verse number 16, he says, Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. It says, there will be those who speak evil of you. There will be those who speak of you as though you are evildoers. And this gives us some insight into the mind of a persecutor. Because we sometimes think that people just persecute simply because they're evil and they want to hurt somebody. But you know that that isn't the mind of most persecutors. The mind of most persecutors, they're not, they're not psychopaths. They're people who are able to convince themselves that what they're doing to the people they're doing it to is the right thing to do. Because he says they call, they're going to call you evildoers. They're going to treat you as though you are evildoers. They actually believe that what you're doing is wrong. And so those Jews that were persecuting the church, many of them thought that they were doing it on behalf of God. Okay? Islam, Islamic extremists, they don't know what they believe is a lie. And so when the Quran tells them to kill the infidel, they believe they're serving God. So persecution isn't just some psychopath going crazy. And his idea here is saying, your life should be so just full of the Spirit of God. It should be um, radiating this meekness and this fear of God. And you should be ready and prepared and you should be setting God a special place in your decision-making center so that your life is so impressive that those people who want to, to firmly believe that you are evil and what you're doing is evil will be ashamed because your life just shouts the opposite. We should have a good conscience. We should live in our conscience so that when people see our lives, they see us that we are true followers of Christ. And they will be put to shame. And their false accusations will be evident to all those around us. And their evil sayings of us will hold no weight. But there is a necessary component. And that is the good behavior of believers. And unfortunately, I think there are far too many believers that we do such a good job of blending in and being just like the culture that if they were to accuse us of doing evil, they They'd find good reason to. 
Our lives don't shout that we're followers of Christ like they ought to many times. And so Peter is encouraging them to, to, to be all out, to be all in, to not just go halfway, half-heartedly. It says in verse 17, For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Peter wraps it up with this thought, It is better to live in the will of God and to suffer than to disobey God and to suffer. You get that? It's better to live in God's will and suffer than to disobey and suffer. See what's happening either way? Suffering, right? So there is suffering either way. You are going to suffer. So you choose your suffering and you choose by whose hand you suffer. Last week, we, when we were making our application, we saw three points primarily from our text. The points where God is watching so his eyes are on the righteous. We saw that God is working. He is listening to their prayers. He's answering their prayers. And we saw God warning us. He's saying that he, his face is against those who do evil. And we could make the exact same three points from our text tonight. We're not going to do that. Um, what I want to do this evening is I want to focus on the reality of suffering and the response of believers to that suffering. And so we'll look at just two points tonight. First is the inevitability of suffering. Peter says, it is better to suffer for good than for evil. All people suffer. Suffering is the fact of a fallen world. There is sickness. There is pain. There is death. There is arthritis. There is heart disease. There is cancer. There is strokes. There is loss. There is depression. You can go on and on and on and begin to list the suffering that people go through. And I know that, that in a church even this size, a number of people here tonight, if we were to get up here and just share the suffering that all of us are going through, it would be a shock to all of us to know the burdens that each other bears. And we go through impossible suffering. Suffering is a part of this life. Those who do evil suffer for doing evil. Unbelievers suffer the natural consequences of sin. In a fallen world, God hates sin. God hates sin because he knows sin brings death and destruction. God doesn't hate sin because he's a, he's a joy kill, not, not because he's just trying to limit the amount of fun we have. God hates sin because he knows what it leads to, destruction and death. And there are natural consequences of sin. In, in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, Hosea writes, For they have sown the wind... They shall reap the whirlwind. You sow a little bit of seed, you're going to reap the fruit, the consequences. And you sow sin, you reap the consequences of that sin. But more significantly, the evil that people do, they will, those who are unbelievers will suffer eternal punishment for that evil. And so not only will they suffer the natural consequences of sin, but there is eternal punishment. There is eternal consequences for those who do evil. But not only do the unbelievers suffer for doing evil, the children of God also suffer for doing evil. We suffer, just like they do, the natural consequences of sin. There are many times that, we're going, that we, we go through some type of trouble in our life, and the truth is, at least an aspect of that trouble is caused by our own foolish decisions. Th this is where I need to work on my mercy, because there's a lot of times, I, my thought is, you made your bed, lie in it. Right? And that is the truth. There are many times that we get ourselves into these own problems. You know, I think there's a better response than, than my first response was. Um, but there are natural consequences in and the children of God are not exempt from those things. But not only that, we will suffer at the hand of our loving Father for being disobedient children. One of the things I know pastors already began, and he's going to be harping on us if you come to the parenting class, is that it is the responsibility of parents to discipline their children. And one of the things that we do poorly as parents is that we don't do that consistently enough. Okay? We allow them to get away with way too much before we finally, you know, drop the hammer. And it's, it's not the right way of doing it. And our Heavenly Father, He's not like that. Our Heavenly Father, He will punish us. You will find, if you're a child of God, that you cannot find 
any type of lasting joy in your sin. It just can't happen. You, you participate in sin, you think it's fun for a second, and then all of a sudden you're, you're just struggling, and, and you're down, and you, you can't explain why. But yeah, well, you might be able to explain why. Not only that, you'll find that th- there will be sometimes crazy consequences of your sin. Sometimes your sin will find you out in ways that you, won't, you wouldn't imagine. Why? Because God is bringing those things to light. Because he wants his children to deal with their sin because he loves them. And so the children of God go through some, type, some suffering because our Father is trying to help us. He's trying to discipline us. <clears throat> then he, he, So he says, those who do evil will suffer for doing evil. Those who do good will suffer for doing good. It's also true that those who do good will at times be called to suffer for doing good. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, we know this verse well. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you live like you're supposed to live, there will, time, there will be times when the world will hate you. In fact, in John 15, 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You realize today is Palm Sunday. Today is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they laid palm branches and they laid their garments before him and they treated him as a king, but he knew the whole time he was walking in on that donkey that he was, he was walking toward his last week on earth, toward his crucifixion, which means that as Christians who bear the name of Christ, we serve a, a crucified Savior. We serve a Savior who was put on a cross by the world. It shouldn't be surprising to us that there are times that as followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ, we are called to suffer for him. Because he was crucified for what? And he was perfect. If we are like him at all, we should expect some type of suffering. Those who do good will suffer for doing good. That is the inevitability of suffering. There is suffering in the world generally, because we live in a fallen world. There is suffering for doing evil, and there are times suffering for doing good. Isn't Isn't that great news? No matter what you do, there's just no way around it. That's the point. There is no way around it. Now, the good news is that within that, it's not just Christians who suffer awfully and that you're being called to this life of terrible suffering and everybody else gets it easy. That's that's not the case. Suffering is just a fact. So you choose by whose hand you're suffering and what what you're suffering for. But I want to bring this to your attention, and this is the second point that there is an aim in suffering, that there is a goal, that our suffering isn't just meaningless and vain. And our suffering is not simply to rob us of the joy we could have on this earth. The the suffering of a Christian is not meant to rob him of joy in Christ. Because your joy in Christ is not supposed to be determined or produced by your circumstances. In fact, the joy that we have in Christ is oftentimes in spite of circumstances. And so I think there are three reasons that Christians are called to suffer. And the first one is this. We're called to suffer for our good. We're called to suffer for our good. Let's read verses 13 to 15 again. 1 Peter chapter chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. If we suffer, he tells us what to do. If we suffer, we are to sanctify the Lord. We are to prepare ourselves intellectually to defend the faith. We are to do those things in meekness and fear. Now, the point is, we could attempt to do some of those things without suffering, right? I mean, we could attempt to say, okay, I'm going I'm to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In my decision-making center, when I am confronted with some very difficult circumstance, I am going to attempt to give God his proper place. But we really never know how we're doing, and it's very difficult to to even try and do that when you're not actually confronted with the very difficult circumstance that 
that attacks that decision-making center, right? So all of a sudden, we're presented with suffering, and we have to choose. Are we going to sanctify the Lord in our hearts? Are we going to give him his proper place, even though that this is very difficult? See, we can say, in theory, we're going to do it, but until we go through it, it's very hard to know what we would do, and it's very hard to even to, to grow that way. It is when we are confronted with persecution that we say, I, gotta, I really need to be ready. i, I got to know why I believe what I believe. i got to be ready to defend this belief. And so suffering is for our good. And it's in suffering that we make decisions to grow. It's in suffering that God brings opportunities for growth. So we suffer because it's for our good. Uh, I was spending some time with Steve and Chantal Peters, and Steve Peters is the head grower of the new, what are those glass buildings called? Glass houses? Greenhouses? Greenhouses, yeah. Across from the ethanol plant. So just an incredible plant there that we got to see. Um, He was explaining to us, we were asking like, hey, I've told this story before about Tara's um, vegetable garden and how it just never turns out right. And I think I told the story about a year ago. I just want to let you know that last year's garden was terrible. <laughs> so we're, we're not improving, but um, we will get it eventually. And I'm sure that it's something that I'm doing that's the problem. It's definitely not Tara. Um, however, he was explaining to us that one of the rookie mistakes is when you plant your tomatoes, you water them, and you water them, and you water them a lot. And what happens is your tomatoes get very used to having water close by, And so the root system never really branches out to find water. And he says, yeah, when you first plant them, you actually want to make those things suffer. You want to make them to really search for the... Because what's going to happen is it's eventually going to get difficult. Eventually, they're going to need to be able to find water in places. And if they don't have a good root system, then they're in a lot of trouble. It's the exact same thing with us. If we're never tested, if we never go through suffering, our roots never have to go deep. We never have to really sanctify the Lord. We never have to really do these things that actually cause growth in our lives. And so as, as difficult as it is to hear, suffering is good for you. I don't like that. I mean, everything in me says, I just don't want to suffer. But I know that suffering is good for us. And so it's for our good. Number two, it is for the good of others. We suffer for the good of others. Verse 16 says, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Here he says, they should be looking at your life and and they want to treat you as evildoers and they want to treat you as criminals, but as they look at your life, they're ashamed. So there's already something happening with other people. Um, Titus chapter 2 verse 8 says something similar. He says, sound speech, that Christians should have sound speech that cannot be condemned. He that is of contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. So they should look at your life and not be able to find the evil that they want to say about you. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, back in verse 12, Peter actually gave us a little bit more reason for this. He, he expanded on what he's saying there. He says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And the only way that they're glorifying God in their day of judgment or their day of visitation is if your good works had a significant impact on them so much that they saw Christ in you. And that's exactly what what Jesus said in, in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So how it ought to happen is that people come up with, to Christians with all of these evil intentions, with desiring to make us suffer, and they see so much good in us and so much Christ in us that they're drawn to the good even though they want to be forcing evil on us. That's how it should happen. And so we suffer sometimes for the good of others. That's why we are called to be a blessing to those who persecute us. And we're a blessing to them by showing them Christ. We suffer for our good. We suffer for the good of others. And finally, we suffer for the glory of God. God is glorified when his children suffer well. I can't tell you how encouraged I have been 
just by seeing people in this church suffer well. When I see them trusting God, when I see them praising God, and I know that it's not a result of their circumstances, I'm so encouraged. It's such a blessing to know that God is faithful to his people even when they go through the worst times. God is glorified when his children suffer well. You you look in the Old Testament, you see the book of Job, and just that, that whole book is an example of this, right? Job goes through suffering, and yeah, Job's not perfect, but he won't curse God. He recognizes that everything he has is from God. Everything he was given, all the good things, was was from God. And so God has the right to take those things away. And so ultimately, Job proves the devil wrong. And that glorifies God. And we can do that. We can trust God even though everybody else would give up. Even though the world doesn't understand why you're trusting the God who's allowing you to go through that. That is, that's a great testimony. That brings glory to God. We have in the New Testament the story of the blind man. And I'm always shocked by the story because there you have a man who is blind for 40 years. And Jesus asked the question to his disciples, why do you think he was blind? And the disciples are thinking, well, it was either his sin or it was the sin of his parents. We're not sure, but we know it was because of one of their sins. And Jesus says, no, it was for the glory of God. So he was blind for 40 years so that one day he could meet Jesus and see again. And so the suffering was for the glory of God. I hope we understand that as Christians, our suffering is not in vain. Our suffering is doing something in our life. It can do something in the lives of others and other believers and in non-believers. And ultimately, when we suffer and we suffer well, it glorifies God. I just want to end with this thought. There is suffering in this life. And there is a purpose and a goal to suffering. But can I encourage you that there is an end to suffering in sight? That this suffering that we go through, though it feels overwhelming at times, it's not forever. It's temporary. And someday, every tear will be wiped away. And someday, every wrong will be made right. And someday, we will be in the presence of God forever where there is no suffering. And so as Christians, as followers of God, we're called to trust him in salvation. We're called to trust him every day of our lives, even when we're going through pain and difficulty. And we're called to stand for him when we're given the opportunity. And if that means standing for him and suffering for for the sake of the gospel, then let's not be ashamed. Let's be willing to stand because we know that it's a privilege to suffer for the God that we serve. Let's pray.